about her, her resume, but it was a very minor point that we changed and we, what we ended up doing in her resume as an instance was we pulled out all the freelance work she was doing while she was a stay-at-home mom, which was a really important point for the client to see because they said, well, she has six years of work history missing. Well, not really. She was doing freelance work, but it wasn't full-time and it was for her own business, which is very different than having a six-year gap in your work would history, I, unless you went to Alaska or somewhere else. Yeah, Thank it be you so much. Stay at home. Um, Sorry, first. Um, you can, but um, we didn't because she had work to, to talk about in that context. So. Because my, my wife's looking at it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's I think it's something because this employer was incredibly. We knew this was a hot button. We knew that we had to address that in her resume because the president of the company. We've used every resume and will reject someone similar, some, summarily just based on the chronological gap, which I think is dumb. But So this is Welcome to My Resume Sucks. This one doesn't. Um, I am a talent scout and a business development person for a training and staffing company. So most of what you're going to see are creative resumes today. And I started with Patrick because, for one, I like him. He's a really neat young man. He is very talented, very focused, and this was his first resume out of quad. What it tells me about him as a designer is that he has a very clean approach to design. This resume is not busy, it's not cluttered, he has a little touch of design here with a little different color on his resume. I love that he has a summary that tells me in a little snapshot something about himself. And then he has his education, and then his experience as a graphic artist, and then he has his cleaner experience. So for anybody who's a newbie or a career changer, I like to see professional experience and then other work experience. Because in this job market too, um, what we've seen is, oh shoot, sorry about that. I time out after like five minutes. I'm working with confidential stuff all day. Um, and everybody that you see here today has, I have their permission to present them, just so you know. So I like to see a differentiation between professional work experience and work experience, or professional experience and work experience. The reason being, this has been a really volatile market for the last two years. And somebody who is a career changer may have worked at Starbucks for the last year, but previously they were an art director. And that really has happened to some folks, or they're at home people, or wherever, because they have a family to feed, and, and they would rather be working than not, and haven't been able to cobble enough freelance together to pay the bills. So that's not the case in Patrick's case. He has his own little graphic design business, but he had a cleaning business. So I made him change it. So and I'm also a techno peasant, so if anybody can tell me how to get to the next page from Full View, I would be grateful. Hopefully that was it. Um, so I had, I had Patrick change his resume. So he's done a little different style. He's using a couple different fonts now. Pretty much the same resume. Most of you would say, ah, it doesn't look much different. He changed his um, summary a little bit. Can everybody read that okay? Okay. Yes, no? Um, I'll just read it. I'll read it. Yeah, if you want to adjust, that would be fabulous. I'm happy to have a digital director back there. Um, and if we need to move that closer to give this just a little. It's, you know, cover one eye, one, two, one, two, uh, move chair up better, yes, you're welcome to sit closer, I, I don't bite hard, but I don't bite hard. Um, so Patrick's, Patrick's uh, summary says, focus graphic, graphic design with skills from traditional or digital concept development. So that tells me that he can do something on a sketch pad. If you want to see a, a pencil sketch of a concept, he can do that. But he can also do it digitally. He's efficient in ideation and problem solving. His education includes printing operations and semester courses in InDesign, Photoshop, Illustrator. He's successful in environments requiring people skills and working with minimal supervision. Um, I beg to differ with him on that because he's really shy. He's super shy, but he's in a rock band which is so contradictory to this designer that I see. But he is super focused. You can put him on a job and he is like laser focused because he is an introvert, except when he's on stage. So the minor change we made in his resume was we had him list us for the two years of his experience because he's been a freelancer with us since May of 2008 so that he's 
showing here what he's done as a graphic artist for C2 and what he's done independently. And the cleaning job went away because it is no longer relevant to the work that he's pursuing. Because he is doing this currently. It may not be every day or every week because of the market, but he's actively working in this field and has eliminated that other activity. The other is important for a while because it says, I'm reliable, I'm dependable, I'm resourceful, I'm committed to you know working. You know, it says lots of things to employers if you have some other work on your history. But really, in this industry, folks want to see the creative stuff. Any questions? And jump in any time. When do you, how do you decide really what you take off? I mean, well, I, myself, for example, I, I'm a software developer right now. But I was a, I fixed hardware back in the 90s. And it's hard for me, since it's been a progression, to decide what what should I eliminate? Yes. Because I mean, everything that's IT related seems somewhat relevant to me. Yes. Even though I'm not swapping out hard drives anymore. Well, my my position on that is anything older than ten years old is too old. So there may be a way for you to incorporate some of your hardware, fix it, break fix into your summary or into another part of your job description without having that relevant experience. The other thing some people do is simply list that previous experience with a bullet or a line and not have extended descriptions about it. So yeah. um, for myself, I eliminated anything after like, I don't know, 1999 or whatever the job cutoff was and said, okay, I don't need anything before that. 97, I think, is mine because of the transition into the next position. Um, Stacy is not a developer. She is a serious uh, business development consultant. She has, I think, a really, it's a busy resume, but she's working at the C level. She's working with national accounts, Fortune 500, Fortune 100 accounts. And Dorothy and I had a discussion before we got started today to say, how do I talk about other experience without having a chronological resume? And one of the things I like about Tracy's resume is right off the top, she tells you three things that she's really great at. She's excellent at business development. She's a very strategic thinker and a strategic marketer. And she has a niche in technical sales. She is used to working with scientists and chemists for many, many years and working in a long sales cycle and doing ideation that can be two to four years for a project to come to fruition and to market. Um, she also has a, a fairly lengthy summary telling us, again, about her business development experience and the markets that she's worked in and OEM, et cetera, and some of the specifics. But she tells us here her areas of expertise, which, Dorothy, is where I think that might be really helpful for you to have a table, not necessarily a table, but that's what you know, Tracy has sort of done here, created a table that lists 12 things that she's really, really good at. Because they say, and I don't know if it's true, and I don't know who the they is, but they say the average person spends 10 seconds on a resume. If that's true, they don't get much further than this. And maybe they look at this first job, and they look at chronology again. And we can see, boy, this person is a steady Eddie. She's been there 20 years. And she's had, you know, it's a privately held company. She's given us some really nice specifics about where she worked. I like that, too, because it tells me what is her industry of specialty and um, how big was the company. She references in here without reading the whole thing to you that she's worked with Fortune 500 companies, that she delivered you know, an $8 million increase in sales. So I know that this is somebody who's really used to working with big players, with big clients. She's not uncomfortable with a, you know, the big check, being able to you know, manage a million plus dollar account. So she's somebody that I know I can present to a client and she'll be, a big league player. Does that make sense? And and there is a lot of information here. Believe me, we've called this down from what was a longer resume. So this is page one of two of them. Um, and what I liked also about Tracy's resume is we saw the career progression at CIREX. So she was promoted three times from 1990 to 1993. And she's highlighted you know those promotions through her resume. She's also shown us and this is important for folks who are in the process of trying to do a career change. She's been in the petrochemical industry, more or less, for 20 years. However, in the last couple of years, she's really wanted to shift from petrochemical to sustaining because she knows that that is where the planet is going and where personally she would like to be. So she's listing all the courses that she's done recently in sustainable business development, um, as well as in 
uh, courses that were related to um, other interests. She happens to be a foodie. She loves to cook. So she's highlighted some of those other things she's done relative to food ingredients and other workshops that are relevant to her passion. Um, and then most, I think another important point for people on their resumes is if you're career changing, if you're in transition, if you're um, getting into a new industry, you want to show what involvement you have either as a volunteer or affiliations or organizations to which you belong to because sometimes that can be the ticket that gets you an interview, that you're being a member of the BMA or the Recyclers of America or um, I happen to belong to um, several organizations in Milwaukee. One is uh, an organization that helps senior citizens. I have that on my resume. I'm really proud of the work I do for Eastside Senior Services, a division of Interfaith, because they help seniors stay in their homes and live independently. And it's an organization that's been around 35 years and works with almost all volunteers except for 14 directors that have a, a salary that's about the size of a shoestring. So they do really important work in our community in helping keep seniors out of nursing homes and staying in their own homes. So I list all of my affiliations, even things that might be controversial. Um, and you say, oh, really? Like, I belong to a really progressive church. I belong to a United Church of Christ in Milwaukee called Plymouth Church. That's on my resume. I also happen to be moderator for the church council. It's like chairman, but they don't call us chairman anymore. That's on my resume because I don't want to work somewhere that would say, oh, she belongs to a liberal Christian church. You know, what would we do with her? Because that organization wouldn't fit my values. So it's purposely in my resume to help me screen out as much as an employer might screen me out. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's, it's a very personal thing, though. In this market, people may look at that differently because right now having a job, a placeholder job, is better in some cases than not working. Any questions about Tracy? Any questions in general? Is that right? Um, this is a, a web designer who just applied uh, with C2. He just joined our roster and we really enjoy um, this young man's energy. And he has a really busy resume. He's got a lot going on here. But we can see nice career progression for him again. He's got an objective. Objectives are okay. First resume out of school, it's okay to have an objective. After that, I'd rather see a professional summary, a snapshot, whatever you want to call it up there that gives me some highlights about who you are. Um, education for Michael could probably shift down here because he's been working long enough that it doesn't have to leave his resume. Um, proficiency, again, this could be top or bottom. It's really a personal decision. But again, if somebody's been spending 10 seconds on this resume, we know he's got a degree. We know all the applications that he's proficient in. We can see right away he's got three years here, five years here, three years here. If I look at, I don't know, creative spurts from Adam in Milwaukee, but boy, the kid lasted five years at Milwaukee Road Festival, Summerfest corporate offices doing graphic design and interactive design. He's already got some cachet on his resume to me. So I, you know, made me want to look further and look at his portfolio, look at his website. And then I can see some of his accomplishments. And we say, holy cow, member of Mensa International. <laughs> when his resume came into our offices, we said, man, this guy is really smart. We want to bring him in for an interview and see if he really knows what he says he knows because we wanted to challenge this assumption. And sure enough, he passed every test we gave him with flying colors, and we look for certain standards for talent. Um, but it was really, you know, all of us really liked seeing that. But we weren't sure whether we should include this in the information we send a client. For the same reason I said, it can be off-putting to someone, because this person might be, oh, he's going to think he's too smart, or he's going to be some, you know, brainiac that sits in the corner. Not necessarily true, and certainly not true in this person's case. Um, I also like that he has the awards that he's won here, because it tells us something about um, his own ability to tune his own horn and his own design skills. Questions? He also included, of course, his site and a link to his site on his resume. Not everybody has There's nothing that. about having that name on the bottom. No, I think it's a personal design decision. It's just a, a different way of, of a designer <coughs> designing a resume. Could you go into the uh, objective?
objective, that comment you made about uh, an objective, I mean, once you yes. have experience, you'd rather not see an objective? I'd rather not see an objective, because mm -hmm. to secure a challenging position with a progressive agency allowing me to apply compelling creative design and further develop my expertise in the marketing and creative industries, it's kind of vanilla. Yeah. I want to, you know, I want to do compelling design. I'd rather know that I am an expert graphic designer who manages projects well, that I have a broad range of design keys. I'd rather see some bullets pulled, some points pulled from here, and in a summary, instead of an objective. So we call like it a, a great professional job. summary up yes. on the top, and yes. just kind of. If we go back to Tracy's, we see that she says experienced business development and strategic mar marketing professional collaborates with OEM customers to understand unmet needs. Blah blah blah. Hers is a little long, but it's telling us more about who this person is. Than a, than a vanilla objective. I want to work for a great company and do great design. Yeah, well, of course you do. So vague. Right, right, exactly. I want to work for a terrible company and have a shitty job. <laughs> of course not. So, so really, why waste the paper? Um, now, this resume, it doesn't do it justice here. But this is an example of a resume of a gal that has a great sense of humor. She enriched her brain in it. She worked that know how to use. Very well, I might add. And people who say good things about me, it's darling. It also, and this doesn't do it justice here, is pink and brown. Very contemporary colors, very feminine approach. Her name is in pink. The circles are in brown and pink. Um, I don't think she has much other pink. This is pink. Her uh, JG is pink. But I love Jenny's resume because immediately you get a feel that this person has a lighthearted attitude about life. And she's a good designer. She has a nice, clean, fluid design to her resume. But never before in 20 years of being in career staffing have I seen anybody create wonderful little headings like that. So it's very fun. And she's fun. Yeah, you know, in the presentation before, there was a gentleman that was um, one of the people that reviews resumes at his company. And he said most of the resumes that come to him are in a text format. Yes. With with most of the formatting has just been blown away, right? So a lot of times it's just looking pretty disjointed. So I mean yeah it's cute and everything else. But but how much of that goes away? None of it because she sends it as a PDF. PDF. All of these are PDFs so that they can't be altered by anybody. Okay. And almost anybody that's in the design field does everything in InDesign or Photoshop or Illustrator within their resume and saves it as a PDF for exactly that reason. And I recommend that everybody does that, that even the Word resume is saved as a PDF so that it doesn't get changed and you get all the formatting sure. coming through. Okay. So good question. What, what about using corporate logos? So for example, if I work for IBM or Pete Proper and Gamble or something like that, to use their logo in there, doesn't that kind of bring some credibility to it? Um, I don't know that I would do that, Michael, because I think that, um, but yeah, you're, you're probably infringing on trademark or copyright or some kind of issues using that without permission, and it's your resume, it's not about them, you're not branding for them, and certainly uh, you can list who you've worked for. I have uh, an art director's resume who's working somewhere else, so I couldn't list them, but he has one side of his resume is a list of all the clients that he's worked with because some of them are really big names. And the other side is kind of art directed, photo, photo directed, etc. It's very simple. But one side is strictly a rolling list of Fortune 100, 500 companies. Go ahead, Chris. I, I don't know if you're going to bump into it later, man. I'm going to wish I were to the end. Go ahead. We'll, um, we'll chance it. All right, here I go. Ready? <laughs> okay. Um, Putting like a website on your resume, yes. that'll give a little bit more depth. Because I know, I, an example I've given already, my wife interviews people to work for, for the company she works for. And a lot of times they'll graduate from Madison, top honors, are involved in the community, great golden resume. They go out on Facebook, see them doing a beer bar, yes. game over. Yep. Yes. Um, if, if people are going to look on the resume, they're going to Google search you whether it's on your resume Correct. or not, if they're really looking into who you really are, yep. what you're going to bring to the game. Um, pros and cons of putting like your LinkedIn site or your professional site uh, you know, on your resume. Um, I like them both. Um, like Jenny's got just her email, but in, as we saw in Michael's, he had both an email and a web link. He didn't have his uh, LinkedIn link, but I think that's the risk that um, 
18 to maybe 20 somethings take when they post every picture of every activity that they've had. And they're always yeah. trying to outdo each other. Right. Yeah. And so, 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 and, and, and even when you yeah. delete it. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, it's you, still you, out there. If you're smart, you can go to a time machine and you can yep. see what they posted. So, you know, that, that is um, something that they will learn about when they lose a job opportunity or they think that, you know, it's just going to become part of our culture that kids are going to learn that they can't do that. We're still at that explosive age with sexting and whatever. Yep. Um, that they will learn. I can't post every picture out there because an employer that knows my name can now look me up on Facebook and LinkedIn and my Twitter account if I put that in my resume and look at my website and see all the different things. When I first started at C2 a couple of years ago, I had a guy that had designed really, really lewd t-shirts for a company. It was a real business, but they were outrageous and they were the first page of his website. He was like, oh my God, I can't send this to guy to any clients because it was so inappropriate. I was embarrassed and I'm not approved by any standard, but it was embarrassing to me. And the whole office laughed about this website because it was so outrageous. And yes, it was an example of his uh, design work and his web layout, etc. but it was just not usable to anyone else. So I said, Chris, that wasn't his name, but Chris, yeah. you need to go find another client, pro bono or not, that you can do a site for to replace this site because really, this could be porn. And so it's exactly. got to go, and you got to do something Porn's else. Porn's become a broad term. Yes. Well, it's and really in the eye of the beholder. Exactly. And, and, and honestly, and I'm not, I can't predict the future, but our, our future is dramatically changing, where eventually that'll be acceptable. Yes. That, that, Probably and, so. And, 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 and it won't, there won't be the shock value anymore. Yeah. I said, well, that, that's a good thing about Big Johnson t shirts. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Must have, no. just and it's just, it's just a matter of time before we just go over the, the next barrier. And, it becomes the norm. Well, and we're so weird compared to Europeans that are all okay with the body and nudity. Yeah, and it's Americans sell everything. You're going to in yet. Toronto. I'm so, all for it. Okay. <laughs> it's it's Is that your campaign? So if this was the but last. It's not on my resume. Well, that's good. That's good until you're actually running for office. That's you know, right. It's, uh, I'm a believer in the afternoon nap, so my, my platform will be the siesta party because I think everybody should have a nap every day. In there. We're right at 2.30 instead of doing the five-hour energy Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. You're exactly. 20 minutes, midnight. the power nap. The, I had a friend who uh, worked we'll, we'll in Japan, same thing. We'll work all morning, take a big exactly. siesta, and then work until midnight. Mm -hmm. right. My son just in service at Google, and they have power nap pods. Excellent. Uh -huh. Where it's like an egg-shaped thing yes. that you kind of a, a lounge thing that you're just sleeping gas, you go off. And you're, you're, you're allowed to do power naps. I love it. Really? And they say you're much more productive exactly. and you learn better mm -hmm. after a nap. Your retention Here's is your better. Head. So Jenny's is the last resume today. I just wanted to bring a few for folks to have a look at. And none of these, again, I will reiterate, sucked. They all have you know, some elements that I really enjoyed about them. And I see resumes from designers that have typos in them where they say, in their summary, great attention to detail and things are spelled wrong. Yeah. It's like, really? Couldn't you have somebody proof this before you sent it to a staffing person that might like to send you to an agency? So I coach people about that all the time and I help people edit their resumes to go from the four pages to two if you've been in the market for a while because there are things that you do want to share in your resume. There wasn't anything I felt like I had to coach Jenny about because hers was great. Um, feel the same way about Michael's. There, I might change the order of this a little bit because I think his employment history is more important than his education, and I get rid of the objective and change that. But I would leave this because he he has really extensive skills. Usually, you're a graphic designer or you're a web designer, but to have that combination and to be good at both of them makes him really unique. He's like a unicorn, um, and then he has a really solid work history already and then accomplishments. So the only thing I do is I move this to lower on his resume, probably below accomplishments, and I change the objective. I just don't think it's, like you said, it's vague and it's vanilla. Um, especially since you said it's a 10 minutes, or 10 seconds. Yes. And it's not adding any value to it. That's what is on every resume. Exactly. It's not making it stand out as unique. And it it's always not stopping you to want to look and dig into it. Yes, it doesn't make you look further. And you know, usually it tells me it's a junior person's resume. They're fresh out of school, so they still have the objective because that's what the career services class right. teaches. Mm -hmm. Got to have an objective on the resume. 
Um, yeah, now that I think I've noticed it, mean, I, I was like all the summer for my job, whatever. Liberating, whatever. Um, in, in your resume, um, yeah, I've, I've done job seeker summer and a couple other classes, and where they're like, um, everything's got to be quantified. Don't say your attention to detail. Don't say I'm um, exact, exact numbers, specifics, you know, a, a quantitative resume. You probably heard that at, at either your outplacement firm or the Department of Workforce Development I don't, I don't counselor, that stuff. because no, no somebody like Tracy can do it, but how does a designer do it or an art director exactly. do it unless they've won an award for something? Well, or they have so, a portfolio website out there that yes. they can direct someone to and say, this is this is the impact I've created. I don't think everything can do can be quantified that way, or that you can have results for everything I, that you've done. I agree. So I'm also, just throwing it out there. Yes, I, I agree also with you. Paint a picture. You can use description to create a shared context to help people understand what you're talking about. Yeah. Even if you are yes. The, the numbers that you don't have a direct impact on the numbers, but you can provide a create a shared context so you're painting pictures so they can see what you're talking about and how it translates into results. Yes. Now, in Tracy's case, she has lots of results listed, but one of the things I like very much about what she did is that she gives us this summary up here and her area of expertise. And the, right at the top, for somebody that doesn't spend a lot of time on a resume, I know right off the top three things she's really good at. How many people in this room could name three things that you're really good at? Just like that. So. Not good at anything. Not good at, yeah, me either. Every position I've held, journalist, Jason, yes. <laughs> every position I've held for, for the past decade, then some, has required a college degree or equivalent experience. And it's usually, uh, I don't have a college degree, I have some college. How do I, what's the best approach for me to deal with my small amount of formal education? It hasn't held you back. Not right? really, no. So, so you are able, I'm sure, on your resume to demonstrate positions of increasing yep. responsibility. Yep. Just like Tracy, she went from being an account manager, the regional sales manager, to our strategic marketing development manager. So we see that progression. If you can show that on your resume and have in your summary, talk about your increasing areas of responsibility, whether it's financial, scope, etc. That's one way to get around it. If an organization is dead set on degrees because that is yeah, a line in the wait. sand that they draw, you know. Yeah. And the other piece we haven't talked about at all is networking. That I don't think people get jobs today just on the job boards. It happens through networking. It happens through bar camp and AAF meetings and the Creative Connect meetings and all those different vehicles for folks to meet one another and learn to work together and say, oh yeah, I met Jason at bar camp and he said he does. X, Y, Z, and so I think that makes, personally, every job I've ever gotten, I've gotten through networking, it's my first one, and I was fresh out of college. But ever since then, it's all been through networking connections and who do you know that I should know and that kind of arrangement. So that has held you back, and I'm sure that if you look at how did you get there. My only right now is to put it at the bottom. Yes. And I, I mean, I just basically give up I have some college. I went to yes. UW Fox Valley and a little at MATC, but don't hold the degree. So I, you know, it's just is there a better way for me to handle that than putting it at the bottom? I don't think so because at some point, you know, like grade point, everybody has their grade point on their I don't. resume when they first <laughs> graduate. I mean, if it's if it's not like a 2.0, um, but you know, the employer doesn't care after the first job. It might get you the first job, but yeah. after that, it doesn't really matter. Okay. So. You know, Michael's case where he's a Mensa member, that's a little different. I don't know very many Mensa members, so he's like the first one I've met in my life. Um, and it's important to him, obviously, because he has, has it on his resume. Apply to Mensa. Yes, exactly. <laughs> See? How do you feel about, say, sending a resume or, or applying to a job that um, they may be looking for someone with an associate's degree plus experience? Or, like, a lot of things I've seen are like, you require a four-year degree or an associate's degree with a few years' experience, experience. Yes. or, you know, eight years' experience doing this or that. You know, it depends. every place is looking for experience more than they look for anything else, I believe. Because to, to get someone in, say, at the job I'm at, that already knows how to do the bulk of what we do, it doesn't matter where they went to school. So, how does that translate out into you know um, presenting yourself on your resume to the job? 
you know, because, you know, I like think that. that goes back to, do you have internship experience? Do you have any volunteer experience? Do you have any networking experience through, you know, being part of a group like LinkedIn where you can now meet the HR director of XYZ through a friend, you know, that you know, you're connected through these many people and can you use some type of personal referral again? It's that personal relationship that might get you in the door right. um, without the experience. Or can you take what are your transferable skills? There's a book out that probably many of you have read already called um, Dis Now Discover Your Strengths. And there's a cheap version out on Amazon, but you have to buy a new one called Strengths Finder 2.0. Web 2.0. That discover you, your strengths. Now discover your strengths. And the new one is leadership. Yes, the new one is leadership. But I like the the first strengths book because you take a quiz online that the Gallup poll developed. They surveyed 3,500 no 35,000 no 350,000 people. Had to get my numbers right and. They discovered that we all have 35 strengths, but we have five key strengths. So if you can figure out, if maybe you know your five, but sometimes for someone taking the quiz, taking a nap, I'm really good at napping. I'm excellent at napping. Um, and talking fast. I love to talk fast. I talk faster than my tongue goes sometimes. Um, but now Discover Your Strengths gives you those top five strengths that you can now incorporate either into this if it's appropriate, because straight, Tracy is a very strategic thinker. She is she is an atypical salesperson because she's a little bit of an introvert, but she's super smart, she's a great listener, and she knows how to incubate an idea for a really long period of time. She's used to a really long selling cycle in this business, so she's very patient, she's really good at follow-up, she's really good at project management. That doesn't necessarily come across in all her three bullets, but I know from an industry perspective, I can present her to a number of different clients because she gets the technical sale. She understands how to sell to engineers and chemists and scientists. That's a very unique person because you can't put your um, glad-handing, happy-go-lucky salesperson in that environment because that scientist will say, this person cannot relate to me, they do not understand my business. She has proven that she knows how to do that over and over and over again. So she has great credibility with her resume. But the strengths finder can be a tool, those five skills can be a tool that you can say, how can I translate these to the business I want to be? Right. How can I say, I am excellent at attention to detail, if that's one of your strengths, because you're in printing and you want everything to be perfect. And therefore, I know how to make machines work correctly and make sure that the checklist that everything is fixed for the patient is working 100%. And you have to figure out how can you translate that to what you want to do next. Does that make sense? Chris? And to, to add on to that, another good discovery tool, tool which a lot of people, Myers-Briggs test, to determine what kind of person you are will determine what kind of uh, job you're most yes, better designed to do. Um, and I know exactly what corporations look for, and I've been in corporate jobs my whole year and my whole life, and I, I'm the opposite. So, so, thanks, thanks. so that's something, yes, that's a big revelation for you, that maybe a smaller business that is more entrepreneurial and more fluid and gives you an opportunity to wear more hats might be a better fit than being the little cog in the big wheel. We, we had a conversation at lunch today, Liz and I, and um, we talked about the idea of enjoying to argue with your spouse, as weird as that sounds, um, that my philosophy I would, is I would rather be happy than right, and my husband would like to always be right. But there are some compromises that happen with that. But it made me think that we both have two very different think styles, and that's part of why we argue. And I was thinking about that afterwards, because it had to do with the Myers-Briggs, and I thought, oh, I wonder what Liz and her husband's Myers-Briggs are, because I wondered if you were both some kind of X, Y, Z, P, because the P is all about the, you know, not getting to a conclusion, but the thinking and the, per the uh, perception and the sort of the, the open-endedness of life. So, so not getting to, <coughs> I want a decision with, today. With Mars and Venus. Yes. And like tasks and accomplishments, yes. and it's in general. In general, thank you. And, 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 and typically. Um, Broad strokes. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Women who would rather feel good about what they did. Yes. In general. But, but my husband is a XYZ P at the end, and I'm a J. I'm a total J. I write like right on that line. I want to know what, you know, tell me what we're doing. 
goes back to that organizing you know thing too. But you know what? Like me, I'm 50-50. I'm like always in the middle of everything. And I think that's where my husband is. So, so we, 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 we play the yin and the yang. The devil's advocate. Yeah. For each other. Yeah. So that's why we never get anything done. <laughs> and and if you're really good at all that, you're also procrastinators. And that oh, makes I'm yes. <laughs> Me too. I'm good at that too. Napping, procrastination. I'll have to think of a couple more. And I once had a resume from a friend that had all the things that she did poorly in a resume, and it was hilarious. And that would be the best one to start with because you know you, you I'm, I'm late, I'm, you know, inaccurate. I'm, you know, I sleep on the job. I you know curse a lot. All those things would be wonderful. Extra long yes. Long <laughs> so, uh -huh. so, you had a question very early on, Janet, when you came in that talked about how do you, and I don't want to interrupt you if you're working, no, um, how do you transfer being in a business to having a work-related resume? Yeah, because I'm not trying to get a job at this point, but if I have a business where I'm doing um, classic text for Tai Chi, I'm not, I'm not doing this. I have somebody who is doing this, and he has no credentials. He doesn't have a degree in Chinese classics. He's just been doing it in his parents' basement for 10 years. And I trust him because he's been incredibly helpful to me. He has written three books, and they're published. Um, so I can put that on his resume. Um, how important are credentials for this sort of thing? In the academic world, it's very important because you want to get a teaching position. I'm not trying to get a teaching position. I'm trying to like generate traffic on a website or, or maybe sell an app or something like that. So, I mean, do I post even, do I even bother to post a resume about who we are? You know? I would say yes, and I would say it goes back to anybody that said in on Wendy's session about LinkedIn this morning, how she uses her LinkedIn profile. Her LinkedIn profile is super rich, and you can have 7,000 characters on your LinkedIn profile about what it is that you do, um, previous work experience, affiliations, slide share programs that she's posted, videos that she's posted, all at her blog. So she's pulling all kinds of information in, including the books that she's reading or the books that you've recently translated or that you're writing. All those updates and profiles can be used in lieu of the traditional resume to send people to that site so that they get a better picture of who you are. Well, we had a blog that was like documenting our experience. Yeah, that would be kind of cute and helpful. People can relate to what we're going through. Just, you know, if he's going to be going up against people who are college professors, which I don't know if he really would be, you know, do you, do you I have credentials too, you know, it's like, I'm lead certified, I'm, I'm like certified as a contractor, but I, but none of those things really amount to anything in the job market because there's a recession. So I wonder how important credentials really are. That's a good question. It is a good question. and. I'd say, you know, from an employer's perspective, I say the lead credentialing is important because it speaks right to, yeah, not even though it's not about what you're trying to do next and what you're doing in your business, it speaks to your commitment to quality and your sustainability, understanding the environment. It just it just says that you're a continuous learner, which I also think is important. That when you get to be old, like 50, um, you want to be able to demonstrate that you are still thinking currently and not using 10-year-old technology or or not staying up with the times and not not using technology appropriately and so I think it, it just is part of, of being relevant today. Yes. Even if, if it's not totally um, tied to what you're doing. I mean I, I I okay, so I have an orchard and I paid four hundred and fifty dollars to get it certified organic. And the owner was like, that's a waste of money, you know. And I said, well, you know, if you're if you have a seller and they only buy from certified organic because they want an outside person, you know, proving that it is, then I can't sell to those sellers unless I have that certification. Well, so I agree, it's not it's not uh, a waste of money if it's a value that's important to you. Well, and and so that that particular person may not be a good client, but there are lots of folks to whom that is very important. So maybe if there's something so. about me that's ecological and about health, I should just go ahead and get those credentials. And if there are people working for me that don't have credentials, I can't tell them what to do. They're just, you know, associates. Yes. Just leave it alone. Or you can recommend if they are, 
if they are employees and not contractors, you can recommend what the path is from a learning perspective yeah. that you would They're like them really to take. Like so friends, that yeah, friends or contractors, <laughs> that's much more difficult. But again, on, Len on Wendy's site, she talked about, and I have some personal things on my LinkedIn page as well, because I talk again about Plymouth Church and Eastside Senior mm -hmm. Services, and oh my God, we're running this giant flower sale for the next three weeks. It coincides with Mother's Day, of course. All that is on my LinkedIn profile. I don't have much time for Facebook, and I don't have grandkids, so I'm not in that uh, target demographic for being busy on Facebook. But Wendy balances, she said, about 70-30 professional with personal on her LinkedIn page, and about 60-40 on Facebook, because all those organic restaurants, restaurants that are looking for seasonal, uh, local produce, they might be great targets for you, and they might be shopping for who are vendors that we can buy apples from for Tartatan in September or October. So I don't know that, but you know that's that's a possibility that there are folks who are looking for folks like you or folks who are looking for the translation. So having a balance of who you are personally and professionally without going over the the edge and having too much personal information out there that you would not want someone to read about you. You know, the, the rule of thumb used to be that you want your grandmother to know. Um, so, like the, the parties, the kids, some of the parties the kids have had with you know, t-shirts and whatever, not necessarily something that would be on your LinkedIn or your Facebook page that you'd want to share as a, as a working professional. Like, Patrick doesn't have any information about his band on there. It is a heavy metal, goth band. This guy, never in a million years would I have guessed this, and the name of the band is Death After Life. So I tease him about it all the time and say, oh, this is the mortician calling, because it would be a, you know, just a great nickname for, and he's the lead singer, and he's this little skinny, quiet guy, I just love him. Um, Do you have so, tattoos? Um, none that I've seen. Okay. So, so I have one who could then also show us. Yes, the, yes, and, and that is a, that is a good question. Um, it's a huge bias with some companies. Like at almost any agency in town, you can send somebody with tax. That is not true at every ad agency or every creative. Some places want a much more conservative, traditional look. And corporate clients, again, you know, that's some of the, one of the things you have to sort of thumb up and figure out, could I send this person? And like, I'm working with a large financial services company in Milwaukee, and they said, don't send me a guy that doesn't know that you should wear a t-shirt under your shirt. I totally get what that meant. I didn't need to have that explained to me. I get it. So, so you know, some of it is understanding their culture and knowing your talent well enough to say, oh, I could send Jason, and I could send Chris, but I'm not sure Rob would, you know, want to fit that corporate bill. Just kidding. Just picking on you as an example. Um, but some of it is knowing your audience and playing to that audience and constantly, according to Wendy, like weekly, updating your profile so that you're always freshening it up with what you're working on, what you're attending. Um, what you're reading, because people pay attention to what you're reading. So that's what I know. And I'd be happy to talk to you offline if you want to talk more about what we started with. So thank you.